reading today is from Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 35, and it's on page 1061 in the Church Bible. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. Then they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels, who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Then they asked each other, Were not our hearts burning with us when he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them, assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Martha, for reading. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you uh, here today. Thanks so much uh, for coming along. Uh, if we've not met before, my name's Liam. I'm one of the leaders here at City Gates Church. A particularly warm welcome, uh, perhaps if you're here and you're visiting maybe friends and family over the Easter holidays or you're enjoying some time away. Uh, it's lovely to be with you here today. So thank you so much uh, for coming along and thank you to those who are watching online as well on our live stream. Really good to have you with us as well. Uh, we're going to be thinking a little bit more about this passage uh, for about kind of 20 minutes or so. Uh, kids, you know, hopefully, just to reiterate, I really hope you did get one of these kind of activity packs as you came in. Please do have that uh, by you. It's going to help you kind of listen to the sermon um, to kind of stay and to kind of see what kind of God's Word is saying. If you didn't manage to grab one, no worries. There's some just out those doors as you came in. Please uh, do go grab some, grab some calling pencils uh, as well. Uh, and there is a prize as well for everyone who completes a sheet. There is a prize as well available to you. Uh, just to reiterate, those under 11 get the prize. Okay, good. Uh, as well, if you, you're here today and the kind of you've got little ones with you and they just need you know, a bit of space to kind of, um, kind of run off some energy or whatever it is, they're getting a little unsettled, please do make use of the crash that we have available. That's kind of out the doors where you came in to the left, unsupervised, but the live stream is on in there so you can stay and listen to that uh, as well. Well, I'm going to pray uh, and to ask God for his help as we look at his word together. Heavenly Father, thank you that when we read the Bible... It is your words. We are listening to you speak to us. Help us to have ears to listen to what you say so that we might trust and obey. Amen. Well, I wonder whether you've ever had one of those moments in life where you didn't know something, you didn't realize something, and then all of a sudden, the knowledge just came to you just like that, and everything all of a sudden made sense. We call that a light bulb moment, don't we? It's a little bit like just you don't know anything, you're kind of sat in the darkness and then, ping, a light bulb switched on and suddenly there's light. You can see everything clearly. 
It's a little bit like that in our passage today. You see, the disciples, they have their own light bulb moment. Because they go, as we saw in that story, we go from not seeing Jesus, even though he's right next to them, to seeing him fully. And we can see what they know about Jesus by the end of the story. Verse 34 says, It is true, the Lord has risen. They see Jesus fully. They see that he has risen from the dead and what that means for them. And so you see our passage today, it's a little bit like a story in that sense. The the disciples kind of go on this, this journey, if you like, of going from not seeing Jesus to seeing him fully, from not knowing that he's even there with them to to knowing who he is and why he has come and how all of God's word points to him. And so we're going to look at this story and we're going to look at it in kind of three parts. You see, because every story, whether, you know, you're reading a story to a small child, to a two-year-old, or you're kind of reading uh, a story, whatever it is, every story has three parts. It has beginning, a middle, and an end. All stories have three parts. So we're going to look at this passage like a story together, starting off at the beginning. Let's see what happens. We see in verses 13 to 18, the disciples are downcast without Jesus. Downcast without Jesus. You see, at the start of a story, what happens is we set the scene, don't we? We want to see, you know, what's going on? Where are we? Who are the main characters? What might I want to expect from this story? Well, here in verse 13, the very first verses of our passage today, we get a big clue. Have a look. It says, right at the start of the passage, now that same day. Now that same day, the, this story is happening the same day as Jesus has risen from the dead. We saw that back in the first bit of Luke 24, where some women visit Jesus' tomb. They see the huge stone in front of the tomb rolled away, and an angel is there. And the angel says to them this, the words will come up on screen. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He, Jesus, he is not here. He has risen. And so the women are amazed. They run as quickly as they can to go and tell Jesus' disciples, that's his closest friends and followers, to tell them this amazing event. So that's what happened before. This is happening the same day. But here we are on a road out of Jerusalem to a place called Emmaus. It's about seven miles away. So it's a little bit like if we were to walk from the center of Norwich out to any of the kind of like surrounding towns and villages that are around the edge of Norwich. Maybe you live in one of those. And so we might wonder, you know, why are these guys walking away from Jerusalem? Why are they walking away? Surely from what the women have said to them, they're they're amazed and they're thinking, We need to stay put right here and see what is going to happen. What's going to happen next? Could Jesus really be alive? But we also see just in the previous passage, verse 11, how the disciples reacted to being told this news by the women who visited the tomb. They say these words. They say they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Nonsense. It made no sense to them. They think, you know, We can't believe this because this never could have happened. And so these two disciples, they're walking away from Jerusalem. Maybe they're thinking, well, we saw what happened to Jesus. We're his followers. People know that we were his followers. We're worried that something similar might happen to us. So they don't believe and they want to walk away and to, to get out of there, basically. And so as they walk along, they're talking It says, the passage says they're talking about everything that's happened. Really, they're just processing, aren't they? They're just trying to get their heads around what has gone on. And Jesus appears and walks alongside them. And he asks them, what are you talking about? You know, as you're kind of talking along, what are you you talking about? And have a look at verse 18. One of them replies, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? These guys are basically, they're amazed, they're incredulous, they're thinking, who is this guy? Has he been living under a rock over the last few weeks? Does he not know who Jesus is? Everyone has been talking about him in Jerusalem and how he has died. How can he not know who Jesus is? And we can see, too, about how the disciples are feeling in this verse, too. It says that they are are downcast. You see, 
to be downcast it's more than just to be a little bit sad or a little bit disappointed it's a feeling of just great sadness great sadness they are mourning they're wondering what life is going to look like now for them how do we make sense of all this they had all of these hopes in jesus they built their lives on following him but but now he's died and so they're wondering what happens next where do we go from here maybe you've experienced something like that in your life just an, a, a set of events or experiences that just leave you feeling so uncertain and you think how am i going to carry on what is life going to look like now so that's kind of what the disciples are saying but maybe you spotted verse 16 verse 16 is quite interesting it says but they were kept from recognizing him they were kept from recognizing him that's that's weird isn't it surely you know these disciples they're downcast surely jesus would come along and go guys it's me it's jesus i have risen from the dead the women said what was true the tomb is empty i am risen surely he should say that i think maybe that they're kept from from recognizing him is that what jesus wants to do is to help them make sure that they see the full picture of who jesus is he wants them to see the full picture Maybe you've had one of those moments where you want to know the answer to something. You want to know a certain kind of piece of knowledge. Uh, and so you ask someone, can you tell me what the answer is? And that person says, I'm going to let you work it out. It can be quite frustrating, can't it? You're like, just tell me the answer. But they say, I'm going to let you work it out. Maybe if you're at school, you've had that experience where your teacher has gone, you just want to know the answer. And the teacher says, I know that you can work it out. I think that's a little bit of what is going on here with Jesus. It's not that he wants them to remain wallowing in their sadness. He doesn't want them to remain feeling downcast. But he does want to teach them something. And he does want to show them fully what has happened to him and why it needed to happen. That takes us to the, to the middle of our story. As, as the disciples see or start to learn who Jesus is, but at first they don't fully see who Jesus is. And that's in verses 19 to 27. I wonder whether you're here and you've kind of, you've watched the classic TV show, Catchphrase. Okay, it might be something that's a bit of a, you know, people of a certain generation will remember it, but I think, you know, it's still on TV now. There's probably repeats somewhere, isn't there? Basically, if you've never seen it before, there's a big screen, okay, that has a picture on it that has like a well-known saying. So for example, the saying might be, it's raining cats and dogs. And the image would have cats and dogs kind of raining down and the contestants have to guess the picture. But what happens is that at first, the picture is completely covered by these different pieces. And so the pieces are removed one by one until people can work out what the picture is of. And you see, sometimes the contestants, when they've only had maybe one or two pieces removed, they just throw out just a wild guess at what it could be. They can't really see the full picture. And see, that's a little bit of what's happening with our disciples here. You see, the disciples, they haven't seen the full picture yet, even though they've been told it many times before by Jesus. They don't really see the, fully picture, the full picture. And so they're kind of taking a little bit of a guess based on their limited view. And so there's two big things that they, we're going to see what they say. There's two big things that they don't realize about Jesus. They don't see why he came and they don't see why or how he has risen. So his life and his resurrection. The first one, we can see that in verses 19 to 21. They don't see why Jesus came. If you have a look at those verses with me, we, we get some clues a little bit about what they thought of Jesus. Verse 19 says, Joel Jesus, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Verse 20 tells them a little bit about, you know, what happened to Jesus, how he was crucified. And then, verse 21, it says, we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. He was going to redeem them. He was going to set them free from the Romans who kind of ruled over the land. That's what they thought about Jesus, and that is what they expected Jesus to do. And so we can kind of see how those two ideas link together. If you think a certain thing about someone, 
well then that naturally starts to develop in what you expect from them and what you expect them to do. You see, it's a little bit like that catchphrase game where the disciples see part of the picture, but they don't see it all. They only see part of the picture. And so that means that they base their expectations on that. We see Jesus throughout his, his life, throughout his teaching, he's always been clear with his disciples of what it would mean to follow him, that he is the Messiah, but he's going to be the Messiah who will suffer and die. He's told his disciples many times what must happen to him and why. Why it must happen to him. But the disciples, they just simply haven't believed him. Or maybe they just haven't wanted to believe him. You see, the disciples have put all of their hopes on Jesus being this powerful leader. A prophet, like they say, to overthrow the Romans. So when they saw him do powerful miracles, powerful deeds, maybe they heard his teaching, powerful words, they thought, this is the guy. He's going to overthrow the Romans. He's going to redeem us and set us free as a nation. We can't lose with this guy. We see when the moment when Jesus dies on a cross, that is the moment that they are absolutely devastated. They literally couldn't imagine a world where Jesus would die, even though he said to them that he would. The second thing they don't realize is how Jesus has risen. That's in verses 22 to 24, the, the second bit of what they say to Jesus. And here in this bit, they're almost kind of recalling or recounting what they have heard from those women that very morning. And they kind of retell the story, retell the facts, but I don't know about you, but you, you read into it and you kind of get a sense of a tone that they just didn't really believe what was happening. Have a look at a couple of things they said. They said, you know, some of our women amazed us when they went to the tomb. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women have said. But, but they didn't see Jesus. You see, the, the disciples are there and it's kind of like they've got a jigsaw to do. Okay, you know like how with a jigsaw, you look at what the picture is on the box and you use that to make sense of how all the pieces go together. The disciples here, with all of these clues, they've got pieces to the jigsaw. They've, they've heard what the women have said. Some of their companions have gone to an empty tomb. And they've also what, got, what Jesus has said to them throughout his teaching when he was with them on earth. They've got all these pieces. But I think because the picture on the box is Jesus rising again, just again, something that they could not get their heads around. They just can't imagine it. So it means that they, they failed to kind of put the pieces together, even though it is right there for them to do. And have a look with me at verses 25 to 26. This is what Jesus thinks about it. He says to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? You see, Jesus here is really firm. And he's clear with us too. If we're here today then, and we're looking at God's words, we've got all the pictures, all the pieces, sorry, of, of the jigsaw that we need. But if we fail to go where the evidence leads us, if we fail to see that Jesus has risen, then that means that we fail to see who Jesus is and why he has come. And in the words of Jesus here, it means that we're foolish. We're slow to believe. question is then how can we see Jesus more clearly how can we make sure that we see who Jesus is clearly of why he came and why he had to die that's the big lesson for us to take today we need to see how all of the Bible all of God's word points us towards Jesus all of it points us towards Jesus that's what Jesus does with his disciples here he shows in verse 27, it says, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explains to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus is helping them to see how all of God's word, it's a little bit like a wheel. 
if you like. You know, there's going to be lots of kind of bits around the edge of it, but at the center of it, Jesus. Jesus is at the center of it. All of it kind of goes through him. All of the spokes of the wheel kind of find their center there in the wheel. And if you take that out, then, well, the whole thing falls apart. Falls apart. And you'll never be able to kind of cycle on that wheel. That's the lesson that we need to take on board as well. Jesus is at the center of all of God's words. Whether we read it by ourselves, whether we read it with kind of friends and family, whether we hear it through kind of a church on a Sunday or through small group, whatever it is, Jesus is at the center of it all. And he helps us to see us or see him more clearly through it. The final part of the story we see in verses 28 to 35, as we come to the end of our story where the disciples delight in Jesus' resurrection. They delight in Jesus. You see, that's what happens at the end of a story, isn't it? Where kind of all the kind of the threads of the story kind of come together, where everything makes sense. All the parts of the story come together. That's what happens to our disciples here. They, they have that light bulb moment. They realize what is going on. And it happens to them over their evening meal. I mean, like what a tea time that would have been. And we can see that in verses 28 and 29. They invite Jesus to stay with them. Don't carry on traveling. Stay with us. But remember, they don't quite know who Jesus is yet. They don't know it's Jesus. And in the next few verses, they have the ultimate light bulb moments. The light bulb moments above all light bulb moments. Remember, it's that moment where, ping, everything just makes sense to them. Let's have a look at verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They have that light bulb moment. They All of a sudden, they realize it's Jesus. Jesus has been the one that's been with us all this time. We might wonder, why was it that particular moment? Why then did they realize that it was Jesus who had been with them? Well, remember, he's been telling them this whole journey for hours and hours, telling them about how all the scripture points to him. And he's been telling them very specifically how the Messiah had to come and suffer and die. And I think maybe just that, that breaking of breads as they have that meal, I think it reminds them of the last meal that they had with Jesus. That before he died, he broke breads. And he said to them, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. They remember this meal that they have had with Jesus. And they realize, they finally realize what Jesus has been saying all along. That his death hasn't been this kind of unplanned disaster. He hasn't come to be this powerful leader to redeem or set them free from Roman occupation. He's come to do something far greater for all of us, for you and me here today to set us free from slavery to sin. And you see, that's why when we celebrate and take this meal together as Christians, just as Philip said earlier, we, we do it to remember Jesus. We don't do it just for the sake of doing it. We don't do it just to, you know, tick that one off the to-do list. And by taking the meal, it doesn't make us a better person. It doesn't make someone a Christian. But we do it because it reminds us of Jesus. That's one of the reasons why we call it the Lord's Supper. Because it reminds us of how he ate that meal. How he was going to be the suffering Messiah whose body would be broken for us so that we could be set free. And so that we could know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's often why we, we call it communion as well. It's similar to the words community. To, to be part of something. To, to know someone. We can know Jesus better through taking this meal as we're reminded of him. Well, as we finish, let's just have one more look at the disciples of how discovering this about Jesus, seeing who he is, see what difference it makes. Because you see, the disciples go, they don't go, well, that was amazing, but you know, time's getting on, it's late. We should probably go to bed so we can wake up early and carry on our journey tomorrow. Now have a look, verse 33 says, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. 
They return at once. They head straight back to the place that they had been running away from because they're full of excitement. They've seen that Jesus is alive and they are running back to tell their friends, to tell the other disciples. You see, that's the effect that seeing Jesus fully and truly has. They delight in Jesus. They're amazed. They, they stop what they're doing. They're, you know, they're in the middle of their evening meal, but they throw down their knives and forks. They grab their coats and they leave to head back another seven miles back to Jerusalem, probably going through the dark of night. And they arrive back in Jerusalem. You know, they want to round up all their friends to tell them what they have seen. So they're there. They're banging on doors. They're waking up people to say to them, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. I'm sure, you know, lots of us, we don't like being woken up in the middle of the night. But this is too good a news not to wait until morning. What does this mean for us then? We, we consider this passage, you see, over the last few weeks we've remembered and celebrated Easter. We not only remember Jesus' death for us, but we celebrate and delight in that he is risen. That he has done all that he promised he would. He has defeated sin and death. He has given us new life with him. And so we can delight in that, just like the disciples do here, that Jesus has risen from the dead. And as we look at God's word, we see accounts of it. Helps us to know the truth of it. And we're reminded that all of scripture points us to Jesus. You see, we don't want to be like those catchphrase contestants who only see part of the picture and they just take a guess at who Jesus is. And maybe that's a question we can ask ourselves. Do I fully see who Jesus is? Do I see the full picture? Or am I making just assumptions or guesses? Or do I have wrong expectations based on the limited view that I have? This passage helps us to see why Jesus came and how he has risen. So let's praise him and pray that we would see him more clearly. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your words, that all of it shows us who Jesus is, Lord, and we see this account of Jesus' resurrection appearing to the disciples, Lord. We thank you so much that you have defeated sin and death and you have risen again. And we can have great, great confidence and assurance in that you have done that. You have done everything you promised you would do. Help us to respond in faith, putting our trust in you to see you more clearly through your word so that we might trust and obey and live it out in our life. Lord, please give us eyes to see Jesus more clearly, the wonder of him and how he is worthy to be praised. Amen.